gosh, and thank you, Aaron, for your willingness to, to jump in to share your story. I, I love being a part of a generous church, and I so believe in the power of generosity. I believe in, obviously, the mission of this church, and I, I just deeply have a conviction that as we partner, as you step in and partner with the mission of the church, both with your time, your talent, and your treasure, your finances, your heart is drawn into what God is doing here in a fresh way. Amen? Amen. All right, friends, we are jumping back into our series on the book of Genesis, and I, I'm so excited today because we are, we're jumping into one of my, my favorite stories in the book of Genesis, one of the most unique stories in the entire Bible, um, and it's just one of those stories that every time I read it, every time I come back to it, every time I look at it, I feel like God is speaking something fresh to my soul, something fresh to my heart. And today we are looking at the story of Jacob. We're looking at the life story of Jacob, but we're really going to focus in on one particular encounter that Jacob had with God. Jacob had several amazing encounters with God, but there is one encounter in particular that is unique to Jacob in the entire story of Scripture. Nothing else like this in all the Bible. It's the moment, it's the story when Jacob wrestles God, or more accurately said, when God wrestles Jacob. God initiated that. God showed up, and he's the one that initiated this wrestling match, this hand-to-hand -hand combat with Jacob. And here's what I love about the Bible, and you'll find this. This is, this is one of the reasons I believe in the, in the validity and the truth of Scripture. The reason I believe that the Bible is true, that it's valid, is because it doesn't attempt to hide or cover up all the junk it doesn't attempt to edit out or hide or cover up the pain, the suffering, the brokenness, the mistakes, the, the lying, the scheming, the thieving, the stealing, all the sin and all the junk of life. It just puts it right in the story. In fact, all the main characters are usually the worst ones. I don't know if that's encouraging to you or discouraging, right? There are no heroes in the Bible, just a bunch of broken men and women stumbling their way forward, trying to obey God and failing. The story of the Bible is not about the heroic men and women, though there were some amazing men and women that did amazing things. The story of the Bible is about God's faithfulness to broken humanity despite our lack of faithfulness to God. That's the story of the whole Bible, and friends, Jacob is no exception. His name alone means heel grabber, literally, because he was born as a twin just behind his brother Esau, and he was grabbing onto the heel on his way out. But the other meanings in Hebrew of his name are liar, cheater, thief, or one who steals, manipulator, Jacob was a scoundrel, and he lived up to every ounce of his name. That's what we're going to see today. And so the title for my message today, if you're taking notes, is simply this, the fight of your life. All of us in this room, we prayed for April just a few minutes ago, but we have seen hundreds of prayer requests on these prayer walls come through over the last several months that we've prayed over. Everybody in this room is wrestling with something. Everybody's up against some form of pain, some type of suffering, some type of situation, either person, place, or thing that feels over your head, beyond your pay grade, beyond your ability to control. There is no way, friends, to make it through this life without facing some level of pain, suffering and striving and wrestling with the realities of the world. It comes in the forms of our family. It comes in the form of our workplace. It comes in the form of our finances. It comes in the form of our health. It comes in the form of anxiety, depression, mental illness, 
The things that we face, the pain, the struggles that we face, it comes in the form of our own brokenness, our own bad decisions, our own lying, stealing, cheating, manipulating of the world around us and the people around us. Often, we are our own worst enemies. And the story of Jacob brings light to this reality. It brings truth to this reality. It shows how God is in the midst of the mess He's never been distant from it. He's never been disconnected from it. He is in the midst of our mess, and he is with us through it. And that's what we're going to learn from the life and story of Jacob. And my prayer is that that is what you will be able to carry from this place as you face the fights that you're facing, the struggles, the wrestling matches of your own life. So let's dive into God's word, starting in chapter 32, verse 22 to 31. If you have a Bible, you can open that up. Otherwise, it'll be on the side screens and you can, you can read along. Here's what it says, starting in verse 22. That same night, Jacob arose and he took his two wives, his two female servants. Um, no, the Bible does not condone polygamy. We'll deal with that on a different Sunday. Um, his two female servants and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok, He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. The man said to Jacob, let me go. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. So the blessing that he gives Jacob is a new name. Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God. You have wrestled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named that place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. He was limping because of his hip. I want to start today by way of illustration. I'll never forget when I lived back in Atlanta, um, there was a gentleman who was a part of the church where I was uh, a pastor on staff, and he was a former professional boxer, like legit professional boxer. I believe he actually uh, contended for the light middleweight title at one point in his career, in his 20s. He was in his uh, late 60s, early 70s at this point in his life, but he would actually train up-and-coming boxers in Atlanta out of his basement. And I remember getting into a conversation with him one day after church, and I asked him, uh, I said, hey, would you ever be willing if like me and some of the guys here from church wanted to come and just watch one of the sparring sessions or maybe, you know, jump in and just learn a few things? And he's like, sure, y'all come over anytime. So we take him up on it. We end up going to his house and He's got this full setup in his basement, and uh, it was just us and him that day, which was probably a good thing. Um, And I'll never forget, you know, he says, hey, I need you guys to put on those, uh, like, the padded hat things that protect your face and your head, and uh, pick out some gloves, all that. And he started taking us through some basic footwork, some things, and he's like, all right, I want you all to come in here and just try some, like, sparring connections, you know, jab, jack, hook, or whatever it was, right? You can tell I'm really good at boxing. I know what I'm talking about. And uh, we're getting in there, and I'm, I'm going with him at this point, and, you know, it's this, it's this, you know, jab, jab, or jab, jab, and then I'd come around with my right, and every time I would come around with my right, I would drop my left hand, and he would say in the beginning, hey, Jonathan, don't drop your left hand when you throw a punch. Keep it up. Keep yourself protected. Okay, sure, yeah, I'll remember that next time. You know, jab, jab, swing, dropped it again, and he just sort of ducked under my punch and 
just slapped me on the left cheek. <laughs> and his hand moved so fast, I was like, did that just happen? It was so fast, right? He's like, hey, Jonathan, don't drop your left hand. I said, oh, okay, I won't do it. I, I won't do it again, right? I don't know, two minutes later, jab, jab, coming around with the right, dropped it again. He smacked me a little harder. Jonathan, if you drop your left hand again, I'm really gonna like hit you with my left hand. You need to get this lesson. You can't leave yourself exposed. Got it, Fred. I will not drop my left hand again, I promise. Three, four minutes later, I don't know, I'm also trying to learn footwork. I'm focusing on different things. I go in for my combo, left, left, you know, come around with the right. What did I do? Drop my left hand. And as I came around, he just kind of like ducked under, popped, just right there on the temple, on the crown. Padded helmet, mind you. Never saw it coming. And not only that, I don't even remember it happening. I just remember opening my eyes from my back on the mat. And he was like, I am so, are you okay? I'm so sorry, you okay? You know, he's, he's in here again like, didn't mean to like go, I mean now, I was fine. And within two seconds, he's like, all right, get up. Keep your legs spread a little wider so you don't flop like a fish, Hanson. Come on, stay up. But I'll never forget that moment because I realized in that moment, this guy could have taken me out at any time. This was not a fair fight. Everything that he was doing with us and teaching us, he was patient with us, he was engaging us on our level. And what struck me about that illustration, that story, and the story of Jacob is this. When God encounters Jacob, when God wrestles Jacob, he enters into Jacob's life on Jacob's level. And what's happening to Jacob did happen. It's probably not gonna happen to you or to me. Maybe, who knows, doubtful. I doubt you're gonna have an opportunity to wrestle God face to face like Jacob on this side of eternity. Could happen, who knows. But you're gonna take some left hooks in your life. You're gonna come up against some situations where you are in a fight. You're wrestling, you're struggling against something. That is the reality of life and what God was saying to Jacob in and through this moment, this was a picture of all of Jacob's life up until this point. What God was doing with Jacob in this situation and through this wrestling match was actually demonstrating to Jacob, Jacob, I've been with you the whole time. I'm actually the one behind all of the struggle of your life. I'm not the one necessarily directly causing the pain and sin of your life. That's a result of living life in a broken world. But I am saying I have a purpose and a plan for all of it. And yes, you're gonna take some left hooks. You're gonna hit the deck. You're gonna face some pain and suffering in your life. But Jacob, you need to understand there is a plan and purpose within God's economy, within my economy, to use and redeem everything that you face and walk through for my glory and your good. For my glory and your good. So there's five things that I think we see in this text, and I want to look at these briefly today. So when you are in the fight of your life, whatever that may be, whatever you're facing now, tomorrow, whatever you've been walking through, there's five things that you're gonna learn from Jacob's story. Number one, you gotta recognize who you are actually wrestling. Because it can feel like you're in a fight with your spouse. It can feel like you're in a fight with your kids, with your coworkers, with your relatives, with your in-laws, with your bank account, with whatever. It can feel like a person or a thing or some circumstance in your life, but you need to recognize there's actually always something deeper going on. Number two, you must face God alone. Number three, you must face God alone. Two different emphases that we have to see right here. You must face God alone, alone, and you must face God alone. All of you, your real self, your brokenness, your weakness, 
bringing all of yourself to God. He wants to deal with you in your places of greatest weakness. That's where the wrestling match happens. That's where the struggle is. It's with the real you, all of it, good, bad, and ugly. The fights, the struggles, the pain of this life, they will leave you changed forever. You will never be the same. The things that you and I walk through in this life will change us. And either we will get bitter or we will grow better through the grace of God. And number five, we're gonna see through this story that God wrestles us, he engages us in his weakness, not in the fullness of his strength, but he, he comes to us on our level. And that's where the hope of the gospel is found. So let's dive in to God's word. Here's the first thing that we see. We have to recognize who we are wrestling, right? So the story starts off, Jacob was left alone. We'll come back to that in just a minute. He sent his whole family across the ford of the Jabbok, across the river. The context is they're on their way back home. He's been serving under Laban, who's been cheating him and swindling him, his uncle Laban, for 20 years. That's a long time. 20 years he's been unjustly serving this man Laban, and finally God shows up and says, Jacob, it's time to go back home. Finally, uh, however... There's somebody waiting for him back home that he's not particularly excited to see. Somebody waiting for him back home who wants to kill him, his brother Esau. Um, In case you thought thought your family situation was rough, this one is going to give you hope today. And on the way back home, when Jacob was alone, by himself in the dead of night, night always represents hopelessness, despair, the dark night of the soul, suffering, some version of that. In the midst of the night when he's all alone, the word of God says a man wrestled with him until daybreak. A man leaves it anonymous. Somebody jumped Jacob. Now, if I'm Jacob in that moment, I've got a couple thoughts in my mind of who this is. You know, I didn't see him coming. Jacob did not initiate the wrestling match or the fight. This man wrestled, stepped into the conflict with Jacob. Jacob's thinking, oh man, Laban just snuck up on me. My uncle, who I just left, I I took his daughters. God blessed me while I was there for 20 years. So I, man, it's all mine, but I left Laban's place with all the goods, the herd, the cattle, all of God's blessing came with me when I left Laban's house, and he wants me back. I guess it's him who's finally come to slit my throat in the night and take back what belongs to me or what he believes belongs to him. Maybe it's Laban. Second thought, if I'm Jacob, is this mystery man is probably Esau. He heard I was coming back home, and he said, no way, I'm coming to him. I'm gonna meet him on the road, and I'm gonna take him out in the middle of the night when he's least expecting it. So there's this initial confusion, I imagine, in Jacob's mind. Who is this? It's night. I can't see. I'm struggling. It feels like my life is on the line. I know there are people that are after me and want to kill me. He doesn't recognize. He doesn't know at this point who he's wrestling. Now, strangely enough, in the midst of all this, we're going to fast forward a few verses. There's a dialogue between Jacob and his assailer. Jacob, in the, in the course of wrestling him, he clings to him and he says, bless me. I want a blessing from you. We'll get to that in just a moment. But the man responded. He said to him, what is your name? When God asks a question, it's not because he actually needs the answer. He knows Jacob's name. He wants to hear it from Jacob's Lips, because Jacob's name represents who Jacob was. The actions of Jacob's life up to that moment. Jacob responded, my name's Jacob, which means liar, cheat, manipulator, heel grabber, thief, stealer, one who steals things. Then the man said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. 
For you have striven, you have wrestled with God and with men and have prevailed. Now this is key, with God and with men and have prevailed. Do you know what just happened here? The man who Jacob was wrestling identified himself. He goes, you've wrestled with man. We know, I know your whole story, Jacob. You've been wrestling with Esau since birth. It actually says in Rebekah's womb, the two twin brothers were wrestling. They were striving against one another. Throughout his life, uh, Jacob was swindling and cheating and vying for the favor of his father and he was the favorite one of his mother so he, he stole Esau's birthright with a bowl of soup. He swindled him out of his birthright and then he stole his blessing from his father. So there's this constant struggle in Jacob's life and what Jacob has mostly been aware of up to this point is his struggle against men is the circumstances of his life. What God is saying to him right now is he's saying, Jacob, there's actually two levels to your life. There is the level that you see. We'll call that the the natural level. It's Esau. It's Laban. It's all the different struggles that you faced as the second born. It's all the ways that you've sought to manipulate and cheat and grab your way into the blessing. Even though God spoke over Jacob before he was born, uh, the younger one's gonna get the blessing. God's plan for Jacob all along was that he would get the blessing because he didn't want, God did not want the blessing to depend, check this out, follow me, God did not want the blessing to depend on the birth order. He wanted the blessing to depend on his gracious decision. He literally was over and over again throughout the Old Testament switching how things would normally go according to human plans to prove over and over again throughout the Bible that the salvation, the blessing, the promise of God to save the world would not come through human means or effort or order. It would come as the grace of God. So he goes, look, the younger one is gonna get the birthright to prove to the world once again that the blessing of God does not follow the human order of things. So there is a, there's a natural reality to our lives. Struggles, pain, things that you're facing right now. The fights of your life that you're up against. And then what God is saying to Jacob when he gives him a new name. Is he saying, Jacob, do you realize there's something else going on in your life. There's something behind and within and before and behind all the circumstances of your life and it's what you can't see. Jacob, it's me. You've striven, you've wrestled with man and with God. I've been here all along. I've been with you through every moment, every natural circumstance you faced in your life. I have not abandoned you, but I'm going to use it ultimately to extend my blessing to the entire world, and I'm gonna change you through it. I'm going to change your name, give you a new identity, and I'm gonna deal with the fact that you're a cheater, a liar, a scoundrel, I receive you as you are, but I'm gonna change you. And it's gonna be a fight, it's gonna be a wrestle the entire journey. So friends, whatever you're up against today, you have to understand you're not just facing your natural circumstances. You're not alone in it. It's not hopeless. Whatever you see in the natural is not the whole story. God can and will and is always working in the background, even through the most painful things that you are facing. God is working in the background and saying, you thought this whole time you were just fighting and wrestling and struggling against your natural circumstances, but I promise I've been with you on your side and I'm orchestrating things for your good. Trust me, Jacob. Recognize who you're wrestling We'll move on from these. I want to get to the next one. 
As you face the fights of your life, the struggles of your life, you have to see and trust that God is behind all of it. But next, you have to face God alone. I want to focus on that word alone. It says of Jacob, he was left alone. And I imagine there's a side of Jacob in this moment as he heads back home. After 20 years of serving under Laban, he heads back home. And it's amazing when you think about this because on the way to Laban's house, Jacob is running for his life. Jacob has stolen the birthright and the blessing from Esau. And what do you think Esau thinks about that? He's like, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. It's Cain and Abel all over again. Said Esau set in his heart to kill his brother. Rebecca, Jacob's mom, heard about it, and she goes, you got to get out of here. Go to my brother's Laban's house. You're going to die. Esau's going to kill you. So Jacob steals the birthright. He steals the blessing by pretending to be Esau, his brother. He puts goat skin on his arms and his neck because his brother was hairy. Come on, somebody. Esau was a hairy man, and Isaac couldn't see anymore. And him and Rebekah, Jacob and Rebekah, they set up this whole scheme to steal the blessing from Isaac. Esau comes back from hunting, discovers hunting. He discovers what happens, and he's like, this kid, he keeps cheating me and swindling me out of everything. Now my father has given him all of it. All the land, all the possessions, all the rulership, the blessing of heaven is on this scoundrel. And on his way, when he's running for his life, because Jacob got the blessing, check this out, he stole the blessing, but it probably felt more like a curse. Because the next day he was running for his life, he didn't have anything. No possessions, no land, no people, no servants, nothing. He is wandering through the desert by himself on his way to Laban's house, running for his life. And look, you may, Jacob, you may have stolen the blessing, but gosh, your sin has produced a curse in your life. And right there in the wilderness on his way to Laban's house, Jacob encounters God for the first time in a dream. I don't have time to read the whole passage to you, but he's exhausted, he's weary, he's running for his life out of town, he lays his head down on a rock, and he sees heaven opened, and he sees God extending a ladder to earth. And the angels of God are ascending and descending on the ladder. It's a gateway, it's an open doorway into heaven, and he says this, I saw the Lord above the ladder, and I saw the Lord beside me. Don't know how that works, but God was in two places at once, right? There he was above the ladder in heaven, and there he was on earth. I think back just a few chapters prior in Genesis. Don't miss this. What was mankind gathering together to try to do? Build a stairway to heaven. They didn't make it. God confused their languages because God said, there is no stairway to heaven, but I'm coming to earth. I'm gonna place my stairway from heaven to earth. Jacob, I'm coming to you. And yep, you just stole the blessing that I was supposed to give. This is God saying this to Esau. You took the blessing by unrighteous means. You're a liar, a thief, and a cheat. But I'm gonna bless you anyways. Woo! What kind of God is this? Nobody can make this up. I think about the Bible, and I'm like, not only does the Bible put all the messiness in there, sibling rivalry, Rebecca loving Jacob more than Esau, Isaac loving Esau more than Jacob, all the family dynamics, brother trying to kill brother, but now Jacob steals a blessing, and God goes, okay, I'll give you the blessing. Through you, the nations of the earth will be blessed. I'll be with you to the end of your days, Jacob. You're the one. You're the next link in the chain. I'm like, what? Why, God? He doesn't deserve it. He stole it. Exactly. Because the blessing of salvation is not dependent on the worthiness of who receives it. It's dependent on the God from heaven who says, I'm coming for you. I am coming to earth to rescue you. If the blessing was dependent on the character of Jacob, 
none of us would get it. If it was dependent on your character or mine or your obedience or mine, we're done. God goes, this blessing that will extend to the whole world through my son Jesus is dependent on me and me alone. And so Jacob met with God alone. He is in this situation. And friends, here's what I take from this. When you're, when you're struggling with something, when you're in the midst of pain, when you're in the fight, when you are up against whatever it may be, no, I mean, you can have support around you. You need support around you. You need men and women of God that know what you're walking through. But I gotta tell you this, there is a moment where nobody can walk that road of faith for you. Not your parents, not your kids, not your grandparents, not your friend who invited you to church. Nobody can walk the road of your life or the journey of your life but you. And you, nobody can encounter God for you. It goes on to the next verse. He said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Friends, here's why God asked Jacob to say his name. Because he goes, Jacob, I gave you a dream. On the way to Laban's house 20 years ago, I told you that you were the next link in the chain. I was gonna bless the world through you but I gotta deal with this. I gotta deal with your character, Jacob. I gotta deal with the fact, Jacob, that not only does your name mean deceiver, liar, cheat, scoundrel, you actually are one. It's actually who you are. And so, yep, I've given you the dream. I've given you the blessing. It's yours. Now I'm sending you to Laban's for 20 years, and guess what's gonna happen there? He's gonna cheat you, he's gonna lie to you, he's gonna manipulate you, and you're gonna have to serve him with all your heart. You're gonna serve him for seven years thinking he's gonna offer his daughter Rachel to you and he's gonna give you Leah instead. And then you gotta serve him seven more years to get the wife that you intended to marry to begin with. And then you're gonna stay seven more years because he's gonna put together a scheme to steal all your livestock and I'm gonna to have to rebuild your herds. And so for 20 years, Jacob, I'm gonna actually turn you into the type of man who's going to lead a nation and I'm going to work on your character. I'm gonna work all the Jacob out of you, Jacob. And I'm gonna give you a new name, Israel. One who has striven, who has wrestled with God and man and prevailed. You have to meet with God alone. No one can walk your journey of faith and fight the fight of faith for you. And you have to bring your real self, your true reality to God. He sees it, he knows it. He will not deal with your false self. He will not deal with your pretenses. He already sees all of your dark and secret spots in your life, and he says, I choose you anyway. The blessing of salvation is not dependent on your performance. It's dependent on God's grace. So go ahead and tell him your name. Tell him who you are. And let him begin to transform you through the struggle, through the wrestle, through the different things that you are facing in your life. Recognize who you're wrestling. You must face God alone. You must face God alone. And remember this, and we'll close with four and five, and the keys can come out as we close. Remember that in this process, understanding that every struggle you go through, every moment of pain, every hardship, every trial that you face in this life, God is with you in it. He's working behind the scenes. But you have to recognize this. Nobody makes it through this life, through the difficulty and pain of this life without a limp on the other side. No one makes it through this life unscathed. 
No one makes it through the, the struggles and the pain of this life without a limp on the other side. And here's what's so powerful about Jacob's story. Here's what we see in Jacob's story. It's unbelievable, and I know we keep hitting the same verses, but you gotta see this. It says, a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, meaning when he saw that Jacob did not let go, right? Just think of, you know, professional world championship boxer versus me, right? What did he do next? He touched his hip. Gave him a little left jab to the temple. He touched his hip socket. Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And in that moment, Jacob goes, oh, this isn't Laban. This isn't Esau. This whole time I've been striving with this mystery man all night. And he's engaged me on my level. He's allowed me to enter into this wrestling match with him. But there's a moment right there where Jacob goes, this is not a mere man. He just touched my hip and my hip went out of socket. Now I can't even stand on my own two feet. And there's a moment right here that we see. The man says, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Friends, let me just translate this for you. There's a moment where Jacob goes from striving and wrestling with God in his own strength to suddenly his hip being out of socket and this wrestling match goes to, I'm just clinging to you because you're God. I just realized who you are and I'm holding on to you so tight because I realize I'm about to go home and face my brother. I'm about to face some music. I can no longer hide behind my cheating and my scandals and my manipulation any longer. You're my only hope. And Jacob transitions, don't miss this, from fighting and wrestling the circumstances of his life to clinging to God and saying, don't let me go until you bless me. There will be a shift if you allow it through the pain and circumstances of your life. Friends, hear me when I say this. When you have to shift from fighting against God and resisting what's happening to saying, Lord, I don't get it. I don't know how we're gonna get through it, but I trust you and I'm clinging to you in this place. That's the story of Jacob. He touched his hip. Jacob clung to him. The man said, let me go. You can't see my face and live. Jacob said, I can't let you go. I will not let you go until you bless me. The closing point is that God enters in on our level. He doesn't show up in glory at the beginning. He just wrestles Jacob on his level. Remember when I, my kids were little, they love to wrestle with me. They jump on me from the couch. And you know, when you're, when you're a full grown dad and you're wrestling two and three years old, two and three year olds, it's actually hard not to hurt them. <laughs> you know, you roll over the wrong way and you're like on them and they're screaming and crying, right? So I would just lay on my back and let them jump on me. And I think what's so amazing about this because I read this story God's wrestling Jacob. Jacob has no shot. This is God we're talking about here. But he engages with Jacob on his own level. He enters into Jacob's life and he goes, I've been the one behind all of this. I'm with you, Jacob. I've transformed your character through a lot of hardship and pain, but now I'm with you even as you go back to Esau. And yes, now you're limping. You're not even gonna enter the battle with your full strength because of me. You're gonna have to face your greatest fear in your weakness. But God became weak, he, he, he concealed his glory, he engaged with Jacob on his level because friends, again and again and again, it's a picture of the cross. God embraces his own weakness, he enters into our story and his weakness as a man so that he can win the victory on our behalf. So he can win the victory on our behalf. You see, there was a moment in Jesus' life 
Just like Jacob said, I'm clinging to you. I won't let you go until you bless me. There was a moment when Jesus was hung on a cross and he didn't have to stay there. He says in two occasions in the gospels, at any point I could ask my father to send legions of angels from heaven and I wouldn't have to do any of this. No one held Jesus to that cross beam. He held himself there for you. There was a moment in Jesus's life where he said, I am clinging to this cross and I won't let it go until father you bless them. I'm choosing to hold on to this, the pain of this, the suffering of this, until you release the blessing of heaven onto earth through my death and resurrection. Friends, that is the story of Jacob. We're going to take communion as we close this time, and we're going to remember that Jesus held on. He didn't let go. He entered in on our level. He is the one behind all the narratives and the pain and the story in our life, working to redeem it and walk with us through it. But he held on so that we would receive the blessing. Amen.